Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is MIFA's webinar for counselors, financial aid, national landscape, and regulatory updates. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, go ahead and type them into your GoToWebinar panel in the question section, and I can go through all of those at the end. I've attached the slides to the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel, and I'll also send them out to everyone today. So let's jump right into some recent legislation that will be affecting higher education and financial aid. The first was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. And what's going to affect really higher education and financial aid is the changes that we'll, were made to the 2018 tax forms. The 2018 tax forms, there's no longer a 1040A or 1040EZ. And if those of you remember who are familiar with the FAFSA, the FAFSA does ask if families were eligible to file these forms. The FAFSA will then have to be altered so that that question isn't asked. There will be a schedule that will be helpful when kind of modifying that question. So just keep in mind that because those tax forms have been eliminated, that question on the FAFSA, of course, will have to be changed. On the tax forms, there are also six new schedules. There will be no more exemptions for dependents, and instead there'll be a higher standard deduction and a child tax credit. So again, just keep your eyes peeled for changes to the 2020-2021 FAFSA. That's the FAFSA, of course, that will ask about the 2018 income. So that's the FAFSA that current high school juniors will complete next year when they're seniors. So you don't have to really think about it right now, but just know that there will be changes coming. The Department of Defense and Labor, Health and Human Services and Education Appropriations Act 2019. It's a long name. You don't really have to remember the name. All you need to know is how it affects federal student aid. It basically increased the maximum Pell Grant to $6,195. So that's the maximum amount that will go to students attending college in 2019-20 who have a zero EFC. That means their expected family contribution is zero. They are eligible for the maximum Pell Grant, and that will be $6,195. That's up $100 from the current academic year, 2018-19. And as well, students are still able to receive summer Pell. This changed semi-recently. Basically, students are able to receive 150% of their Pell Grant during the academic year, including summer. So that's good news for students who want to go to college in the summer to basically escalate the completion of their degree. So now those students who are eligible for Pell Grants are able to receive them in the summer for their summer classes. A few years ago, that wasn't possible. So that's still regulation that's out there for college students. That legislation also, it provided continued funding for federal work study and federal SEOG. Federal work study, as most of you know, is that work program for students. They work on campus and they're paid in a paycheck form. Funding from that comes from colleges and universities, but also from the federal government. So that funding is continuing, which is good news. And then federal SEOG is just another grant, smaller than the Pell Grant, but similar in that it's a grant for students going to college that funding for that grant has continued, which is good news. That legislation also provides federal loan deferment for students who are receiving cancer treatment. So if there is a student in school who is receiving cancer treatment or paying back their loans, their loans are deferred during cancer treatment and the interest is subsidized. So that's good news for students who unfortunately are going through cancer treatment. And the legislation also created temporary extended public service loan forgiveness, and it also provides for public service loan forgiveness outreach. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So for those who aren't aware, public service loan forgiveness is a program. It's been around for just about 10 years, but the students who have benefited just starting just started being able to apply for the forgiveness of their loans. Basically, it's a program that allows 
borrowers of federal loans to have their loans forgiven after they've repaid those loans for 10 years. And these borrowers have to work in public service. So their employment has to fit into a few different very specific categories. They also have to be in basically a loan repayment program that is tied to their income because the standard loan repayment is 10 years. So after 10 years, if you're in standard repayment, your loans would already be finished. You would have repaid them in full. But if you in, enter into one of those repayment programs based on your income, your repayment is actually extended. And that's what these borrowers are doing. They have this extended repayment, but if they work in these certain fields, after 10 years of loan repayment, the rest of their loan is forgiven. October 2017 was the first month that borrowers were eligible to apply for this loan forgiveness if they had been in repayment 10 years. As of June 2018, over 28,000 borrowers of federal loans had applied but only 96 had been approved, so a very small percentage. Most of those who've been denied are not meeting requirements, so perhaps they don't actually work in public service, or they haven't been repaying their loans over 10 years, or they haven't been repaying their loans on time. There are stipulations that students or borrowers have to follow to be eligible for this program. So what the legislation is doing, what the department is doing is basically extending more outreach to borrowers to educate them better about the requirements for this loan forgiveness program. And they also instituted this temporary public service loan forgiveness. This temporary loan forgiveness is just a temporary expansion of the public service loan forgiveness. And it's directed to those borrowers who fit into every other requirement they did everything else they were supposed to, but they ended up not being in a qualifying repayment plan. So there are certain loan repayment plans that qualify for this public service loan forgiveness. For those borrowers that did everything else right, but they just ended up being in a non-qualifying repayment plan, the Department of Education is now actually going to approve those borrowers for loan forgiveness. Over 33,000 individuals have applied for this temporary expansion of public service loan forgiveness. Only 26 so far have been approved. Most of those haven't met other requirements, so they've met, they basically haven't met more than one. They're not, they haven't repaid for 10 years, they haven't repaid on time, etc. But for those borrowers who thought they were really on track to receive this loan forgiveness, but we're in a non-qualifying repayment plan, but did everything else right, they can apply for this temporary expansion of public service loan forgiveness. And then the consolidation, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018, how that affects higher education is that it created the Children of Follow, Fallen Heroes Scholarship within this an act that creates this scholarship. This is a scholarship for students who have a parent or a guardian who died in the line of duty while working as a public safety officer. In order to receive this scholarship, students must already be, already be eligible for a Pell Grant, so they must already be low income and be eligible for a Pell Grant. If they are, this scholarship will basically turn their partial Pell Grant into a full Pell Grant. So remember that, pull, that full Pell Grant is $6,195. If I'm a student, my parent or guardian has died in the line of duty while working as a public safety officer, let's say I was eligible for a Pell Grant of $2,000. That $2,000 will automatically go up to $6,195. And this began with this current academic year, 2018-19. So let's go into some recent changes and updates through the financial aid process. There were some changes to the FAFSA this year. The FAFSA.gov homepage changed a bit. When you go to FAFSA.gov or FAFSAED.gov, the FAFSA homepage is going to be a, lit, a little bit different. You can see a picture on your screen there. That's the new URL of FAFSA.gov it actually goes over to studentaid.gov. So this is a page actually on studentaid.gov. That's not really important to know, but you'll notice it, that the URL will actually switch over to studentaid.gov. This is your new FAFSA homepage. Still prompts students to either start a new FAFSA or to log in. 
if they're a returning user. Bigger news with the FAFSA is that the Department of Education did a lot of work to make sure FAFSA.gov, the web page, now fits better on mobile devices. It used to be if you were applying to do your FAFSA or submitting your FAFSA, changing your FAFSA, and you were on a phone or a tablet, the web page didn't really fit well into your mobile device. And so a lot of changes have been made. So now FAFSA.gov does fit better, and you can view it much better on your mobile devices. Bigger news is that the Department of Education created basically an app for your phone or tablet. It's the My Student Aid mobile app. And on that app, students, parents, families can begin, complete, and submit a new FAFSA or a renewal FAFSA. So that's big news. It used to be really families had to get on a, a desktop or a laptop. They could do the FAFSA on their home on their phone, but as I mentioned on the previous slide, it, it didn't really view well. Now, parents, students can use this mobile app. They can still use a phone or a tablet and go into a browser like Safari and do their FAFSA, but it's actually much easier to use the app like it is for many web pages that have created their own mobile app. Within that app, and you can see it on your screen, the left-hand image shows that first basically home page of that app. And then if you click those bars on the upper right, this is the menu that you'll get. So you'll see that students can look at their profile. My FAFSA is basically where they can complete their FAFSA. My Money is a pilot tool. It's not available yet, but that's going to be rolled out soon. And then you can see students can click on My Federal Loans, where current college students can view basically all of their federal aid right in the app, which is helpful. My College Scorecard is that tool that's available that basically allows students to compare colleges and really the financial data of colleges, the average net price, average loan debt of students. So as students are going in the app to complete their FAFSA, they can learn a lot about the colleges where they're applying. And then there's contact information and then a link right over to studentaid.gov. And studentaid.gov is that great website just with a lot of information about federal student aid. So this is big news for the FAFSA community for higher education. So far in the 2019-20 FAFSA cycle, 10% of FAFSAs have been submitted via this, via mobile device or basically via this, either this app or students using their own browser in their mobile device to go through. Okay, so for FAFSA tips, this has changed uh, slightly as well. Within the FAFSA, as students are going through, you can click on the question mark icon that you see on your screen after any question, or I should say at the end of any question, at the end of that line. And you'll be popped over to studentaid.gov. Right on there, you'll, in, you'll be able to view more information about that question, any related topics, and you'll also have the opportunity to provide feedback. So for example, for what you see on your screen, I was on the FAFSA and I was answering the question to type in the student's FSA ID. By clicking on the question mark at the end of that question field, I was brought to the screen. So it gives me information about what exactly is the FSA ID. If I wasn't sure, this screen will give me information about the FSA ID. There's a related topic. So if I clicked on what is an FSA ID and will I need it to complete the FAFSA, that green text, that'll bring me over to an article on the, basically on studentaid.gov that gives me more information about the FSA ID. So I'm just getting more information here. And then Federal Student Aid is asking us to really respond. Are they providing helpful information? Is this answer helpful? You can click yes or no. And then you can explain, if you clicked no, you can explain why you clicked no. So let's say you were looking for more information or more detailed information. Go ahead and let Federal Student Aid know in that box because then they can improve this information that they have stored in the FAFSA. Other FAFSA important information. We've got the IRS Data Retrieval Tool. This is a tool you're probably familiar with. It's been around for a few years. It, there was a point last year where it was not available. It is available this year. But because of changes to security, when users use the IRS Data Retrieval Tool, they'll pull in their IRS information, their tax return information from 2018 into the FAFSA. 
but they won't be able to see those answers, those tax figures on their screen. They'll just see a message that the information was pulled from their IRS tax return and brought right into the FAFSA. So they won't be able to view those figures, their, their adjusted gross income, etc. This is really just to protect families and students, protect their security, protect their information. So they can rest assured that the information was transmitted correctly, but they won't actually see those figures. Also new, those with amended tax returns are now able to use the IRS data retrieval tool. And then the demo site is very helpful. This is really open to anyone. Very helpful for counselors who just want to become more familiar with the FAFSA. You can go to that URL on your screen, use that username and password, and the tool actually allows you to go through an entire FAFSA. So you can put in information. You just get familiar with the questions that will be asked of families. So highly recommend that. I do it every year. Just a reminder who's eligible for federal and state financial aid. U.S. citizens and eligible non-citizens. So eligible non-citizens include U.S. permanent residents, there are a few other small categories of individuals who count as eligible non-citizens, but for the most part, students do need to be a citizen or a permanent resident to be eligible for federal and state financial aid. Those who are not eligible include undocumented students. This includes DACA students. In Massachusetts, those students do qualify for in-state tuition, and there are some scholarship opportunities, but unfortunately they don't qualify for federal or state aid. We do have a recorded webinar on our counselor training and events page. So definitely recommend that you view that. That's available anytime. And it includes information about connecting undocumented students to college access and oppor college access opportunities. A reminder, males 18 to 25 years old must register for selective service. And that defines, or basically males are defined as male at birth. Those students do need to register for selective service to make sure that they're eligible for federal financial aid. And then finally, for students that are enrolled in degree and certificate programs, if they're admitted to a program and it does basically require remedial coursework, Students can receive aid for one year of remedial, remedial work, so that's good news if they need remedial work in order to continue in that program. And if they're taking prep coursework that is necessary for enrollment in a degree or certificate program, they can receive a direct loan to, in order to pay for those programs. Okay, just a few pieces of information about the CSS profile. As many of you know, this is the other financial aid application, about 250 schools, colleges, universities, and then scholarship programs use the profile every year. It opens October 1st, just like the FAFSA. If you didn't see it last year, this is the new homepage, that image you see on your screen. You can simply go to cssprofile.org to get there. Last year, the registration section was removed, so it used to be there were about 21 questions within the registration section that students had to answer, and then once they finished that, they would navigate into the profile application. Now students just start right in. The left-hand sidebar shows every section as students go through. The profile, unlike the FAFSA, asks families to list all parents, up to four. So for example, if a student's parents are divorced and maybe they're both remarried, that student will list all parents. Only the student and the custodial parent and then that parent's current spouse will actually do the profile just like the FAFSA, but the non-custodial parent, that other biological parent, and then if that parent has a spouse, that couple will do a separate profile. That's required for a lot of schools. Not every school, but a lot of schools. The profile like the FAFSA asks for 2017 income information. It does ask families to estimate their 2018 and 19 income information. There's just a few questions about that, but the majority of the questions, just like the FAFSA, are going to be asking about 2017 income information. Unlike the FAFSA, which is free, the profile does have a cost to submit, though there are fee waivers given to lower income families. And there's a new student dashboard, it was new last year, that does show 
a lot of information for the family, the application status, due dates, additional forms required, etc. There are customer service numbers, which is helpful for families, both for the profile and for IDOC. IDOC is that scanning service that some schools use, asking families to submit additional documentation. Only schools that use the profile actually use IDOC, but it has their own customer service number. If you want more information about the profile, we do have a webinar recording on MIFA.org slash events, so you can view that anytime. Just gives great overview of the profile application. So next steps in financial aid. One, of course, is verification. As many of you know, verification is a, it's a federally mandated process. It requires a lot of families, and we're talking millions of families, to provide additional documentation in the financial aid process. It used to be that families had to submit a tax return transcript, and this they could obtain on the IRS database or IRS website. As of September 2018, the tax return transcript is having some sensitive personal identifying information obscured. So basically, only the, the last few digits of the social security number will be displayed. So that's just some, something for families to know. And transcripts can also be given a customer file number if families request it. And that's just helpful to tie the transcript to the student's file at the college or university. There's been recent new directives from the Department of Education, and that's basically that colleges and universities can now accept a signed copy of the tax return. This is huge news. So instead of families having to go on irs.gov or call in and request a tax return transcript, colleges and universities are now able to accept just a signed copy of the family's tax return. And this is so helpful because most families already have a copy of their tax return, so they can easily just forward that to the colleges and universities. Families still can submit that tax transcript and use the IRS data retrieval tool, but they can also just submit their tax return, which is, which is great news for families. You might be familiar that families who say they haven't filed taxes often have to verify that they didn't file taxes. And dependent students don't have to do that because colleges and universities know that most dependent students or a lot of dependent students just don't file taxes because maybe they didn't work or they just worked a small amount. But for parents of dependent students or independent students, they are still required to obtain some type of documentation from the IRS. They basically need to request a tax return from the IRS and then receive a statement saying, we don't have a tax return on file. And this proves that they, it at least proves enough that they didn't file taxes with the IRS. However, colleges and universities now can accept a signed statement from the family if the family says, you know, I tried to get documentation from the IRS, I gave a good faith effort, and I just wasn't able to get anything. Now with this new directive, colleges and universities can just accept a signed statement from a parent or an independent student saying, I did not file taxes in 2017. And they are also asked to submit their W-2 form if they did work and receive at least a small amount of income. This also goes with extension filers or applies to extension filers. So those are those tax filers who have not filed taxes in 2017 because they got an extension. They are also able to submit a signed statement, but they do also have to submit the copy of their extension application, basically showing that they did apply for an extension. So again, big news. Families no longer have to submit a tax return transcript. They can now just submit signed copies of tax returns. Just a word on appeals. And again, this is for students who have received their financial aid award letters and they need additional funds. They, many colleges and universities will accept an appeal from a family asking for additional funds. And they normally have to submit to the financial aid office a letter explaining why they need additional funds. Documentation, any documentation is helpful. Maybe they had some large bills they had to pay lately or someone recently got laid off. Any documentation that backs up their claim that they need additional funds is helpful. Financial aid offices love documentation. Families should submit whatever they have that's relevant. 
And then it's helpful for families to submit a current financial plan. Colleges and universities really prefer the word appeal to negotiation. So let families know that instead of calling a financial aid office and asking how they want to or could negotiate their financial aid award, they should use the term appeal instead. And we have a new blog coming out next week, Can I Ask a Financial Aid Office for More Money? We interviewed three different financial aid offices in Massachusetts to get their take. Basically, how do they handle it when families ask for more money? So that'll be super helpful for both families and for you, counselors. So again, that'll be published on our blog next week. So some additional fi federal financial aid updates. Federal direct student loans are those loans that are given to students once they submit the FAFSA. The interest rate is set every year for each academic year's loan. So for the current academic year, 2018-19, the undergraduate direct loan has an interest rate of 5.05%. That's for the subsidized and unsubsidized loans. The graduate direct loan has an interest rate of 6.60%, and then the PLUS loan has a rate of 7.60%. Those all went up from last year. So those are the rates for this current academic year. Those interest rates will be set for those loans. However, next year, when the current high school seniors are going to college, they'll have new loans with new interest rates. And again, those will be set this upcoming summer. There are new loan fees as well. So all of these federal direct student loans have a fee associated with them. That fee is calculated and then subtracted actually from the loan amount. The federal direct undergrad and graduate loans have a fee of 1.062%. And then PLUS loans have a pretty hefty fee, 4.248%. Those of you who are familiar with the federal Perkins loans, those are no more. The last loans were awarded in the 2017 academic year. That program has been discontinued completely. And then finally, just some news from the Department of Education. They are trying to combat debt relief companies. So these are companies that are finding borrowers and basically calling them and asking them to pay a fee. And in return, these debt relief companies are promising to help with repayment. However, these are basically scams. These, all of the borrower benefits that these companies are offering to students and borrowers are already available free of charge to students and to borrowers. So students just need to be wary if they do receive a call from a debt relief company offering to help them with repayment or maybe lower their repayment for a, a fee. Some of these may even use the Department of Education logo unauthorized. So just a word to students and borrowers just to be careful if they receive phone calls. Just wanted to point out some Department of Education resources. The college scorecard I mentioned earlier, this is a great tool. It's now available in that My Student Aid app. It just allows students to compare colleges, the average net price of each college, the six-year graduation rate, student debt information, so how much are students at that school borrowing, and what's the median alumni salary? How much are students making after they graduate? So you can see on the screen we've got Framingham State, tells the number of undergraduate students, shows where it is, and then shows those figures, the average annual cost, graduation rate, salary after attending. So students can pull up certain schools and then actually compare them side to side, which is helpful. And the URL is collegescorecard.ed.gov. College Navigator is a great tool, really helpful in the admissions process. It allows students to search for colleges based on certain criteria. And within each college's page, students can find information about admissions, for example, the deadlines and requirements, academics in that school, for example, certain majors, the graduation rate, average net price, loan default rate. Students can also save a search and return to it later, which is great. Let's say they're looking for four-year undergraduate nursing programs in New England. They get a list. They can save that search and refer back to that list. Students can go to collegenavigator.gov to use this tool. And this is the financial aid shopping sheet. This is a terrible name, but it's basically just a template that colleges and universities can use 
to communicate their financial aid award information to students. So this is a template that the Department of Education put out. Colleges and universities can opt to use it. And you can see it shows the average or the estimated cost of attendance, which is helpful at the school, then shows the financial aid the student received, their net cost, so what will they pay after taking into account their, their free money, grants and scholarships, then shows the loans they've received and other options to pay the bill. It also shows on the right-hand side some information about the school, which is great, the graduation rate, loan default rate, borrower debt, so this is really what the Department of Education is trying to do, help colleges and universities be more transparent with their information and show how many students are actually graduating from each school. What is everyone borrowing? Who's defaulting on their loans? So this is all in an effort to help students and families learn more about schools and learn the true cost of going to college. On the back of this financial aid shopping sheet is a glossary with terms helpful for families to understand. And this is used by over 30,000 institutions ac across the country. So you probably recognize this template as counselors or have seen schools use something similar. This is studentaid.gov, that website I mentioned. This is full of information all about federal financial aid. So who's eligible, how to apply, the different financial aid that's available, Pell Grants, direct loans, etc. So definitely recommend that you bookmark this site. It has a lot of great information. And there's also an 800 number for federal student aid. It's 800 for fed aid you, Anyone is welcome to call MIFA with questions about financial aid, but if students have a specific question about their FAFSA or their federal aid and they want someone to actually look at their account, their federal student aid account, they can call that 800 number. And Department of Education actually has a really helpful blog, including information about financial aid and then paying for college and repayment. Some sample posts, 12 common FAFSA mistakes, so they have a lot of posts about the FAFSA. Eight ways to get the most out of your college experience, so there are some posts just really about college. And then how do students calculate your financial aid, really giving some insider knowledge into the financial aid process. That blog is located at blog.ed.gov. And you can also, as counselors, subscribe to the Department of Education's Daily Digest Bulletin. I get that every morning. And that'll give you highlights of recent blogs. Studentloans.gov is another helpful website. This is really helpful to students as they start borrowing federal loans once they're in college and in repayment. There are loan counseling demos that help students understand their loans, manage their spending, create a repayment plan for those loans, give them tips to avoid default and helping them make their finances a priority as they graduate and start repayment. There's a repayment estimator, which is really helpful. High school students can use this as well. If students already have federal loans, they can actually log in and their federal loan information will feed into the re repayment estimator. But even if students don't, they can use it without a login and they can put in the amount that they think they'll borrow in loans. The repayment estimator will give them an idea of what they'll end up paying in interest over the course of the loan and what they'll actually end up repaying. Because as we know, when we borrow a loan, if there's interest on that loan, and most every loan has interest, when you pay back that loan, you're going to pay back more than you actually borrowed. So this just is very eye-opening for students to understand when they borrow a certain amount, how much they'll actually repay after the life or through the life of the loan. And the financial aid toolkit is a tool for all of you, counselors, educator, educators, college access professionals. This is basically information about financial aid. Give some outreach tactics and resources if you want to basically work with some of your students and teach them more about financial aid or go through some exercises. There are videos on here, worksheets, different tools you can use to help students learn more about the financial aid process. And that toolkit is located at financialaidtoolkit.ed.gov. So that concludes the webinar today. This is our information, collegeplanning at mifa.org, our 800 number. And then mifa.org, of course, is our website. For those that need to jump off, you can go ahead and do so, and I'll send out these slides later today with a recording of this webinar. But if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar panel, and I'll be happy to answer those. There's one question about the maximum Pell and how that hasn't been yet awarded. 
that's probably because there are schools that are a little bit behind in their software and they haven't loaded in the maximum Pell amount. But if they're EFC students, they should be getting that 6,195. So likely that schools, once they correct their software, will go ahead and update those financial aid award letters. I don't see any other questions right now, but I'll take a few more seconds if anyone has anything else they want to ask. Also, of course, you can call us or email us anytime. Connect with us through finance, or sorry, for through Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn and ask questions that way. And you can reach out to us anytime. Winter, spring, summer, we're always here answering questions for both families and counselors. Doesn't look like there's any more questions. So I'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Again, reach out if we can help in any way as you help students through college planning. Have a great day.